Welcome to part five of my series looking at Carl Bau's television program Creation in the 21st Century. Uh, the specific episode I am looking at now is uh, stars Floyd Nolan Jones and is called... Big Vagina? Gigantic Vagina. What? Biggest Vagina known to man. Huge! You're kidding. Are you telling me the truth? It's gigantic. Gigantic. No, wait, I'm sorry. That's not right. It's... Uh... The gaps are enormous. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I know I am such a child. Uh, but let's, uh, c let's continue on here. Appendage. Now, the audience needs to remember there is not one single fossil between here between and here. The there, intermediate. There are no transitional forms. Or intermediates by the tens of thousands right. would be required. Right. And so think, and, and what would half of a wing be? In other words, if you took this creature, and while he's trying to develop into this through evolution, we get to a halfway point, you see, <laughs> he would be dragging around something that doesn't fly. He's lost his ability, his hind legs that he used to run and catch prey and flee from predators, okay, that might be larger than he, have now, they're halfway between here and here. Um, he has no chance. You just made a major statement. He can't run away and no. he can't fly. Wow, you know, he actually raises a really good point here. I mean, I, I, I sure don't have an answer. I mean, I, can anybody, can any of you think of any possible function a half a wing would have? I mean, what good would it be if it can't fly with, with, with something? You know, with a half-evolved wing, if you can't fly with it, what good is it? You know? Just uh, let's think about this for a second. Does it need... No, nothing comes to mind. I, 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 I don't see a single possible function for a half a wing. The next one I would like to show the audience is uh, this uh, 35, quote, quote, 35 million uh, years ago is what MYA stands for. That's the Eocene. We have uh, our specific example is only uh, 50 feet long, but they became as large as 70 feet long. This is Bacillosaurus. And the older name that I learned him under was Zuglodon. Now, for the audience, that's simply a whale. That's a whale. And supposedly, he developed from Masonics, which looked like this, which is, a, as the audience can see, a hairy four-legged land mammal that was about five feet long. So again, I question the purpose behind having a speaker on uh, whose information is so completely out of date. Uh, the information he's talking about here is uh, minimally over, uh, shown to be incorrect over 20 years ago. Uh, he's talking about the fact that it originally, based on teeth, uh, that the Mesonychids, which is an extinct group of, of mammals, uh, Lauraceaetheres, that they were related to or the ancestral stem group from which the whales were derived. This was believed because they, they have very similar teeth. The prim primitive whales, um, the, the um, archaeocetes, and the mesonychids have very, very, very similar teeth. Um, now, through, well, actually 20 years ago, um, based on better fossils um, and based on genetics, uh, the molecular analysis of, of artiodactyls, whales, um, hoof mammals and whales, uh, we have a really good idea as to where they belong um, and it's now proposed, it's now pretty pretty clear that these mesonychids have teeth in common with primitive whales as a plesiomorphic character, meaning they that's the group, the, the stem Lorazeotheres, the stem group from which whales and the even-toed hoof mammals are derived, uh, had those kinds of teeth. And they were retained in these mesonychids and retained in the primitive whales. Um, so they, they don't imply a, they imply a common ancestry, but they don't imply a close relationship necessarily. Um, in fact, with, with, with the fossils of the whales, which we'll get into in a bit here, uh, a little bit, um, and genetics, it was shown that the hippo hippopotamuses, not hippopotami, by the way, that, that, again, when you have a Greek root, you pluralize a Greek word, it's 
E-S on the end, not I. I is for Latin words. Hippopotamus is a Latin word. I mean, a Greek word, I'm sorry, not a Latin word. So they're, anyway, it's hippopotamuses, just like it's octopuses. Um, sorry, a little diversion there. But anyway, the whole point is, is that we know, from looking at um, both primitive whales, um, the limbs of primitive whales, the whales that had um, real arms and legs, and also the genetics that they are closely related to the hippopotamuses. In fact, they, they're probably both hippopotamuses and early whales are derived from the, a group called the Ancro, Ancro, Ancrotheres, if that's correct. Um, uh, that that the, this stem group of ungulates of the, that split off from the rest of the ungulates, the, other, the rest of the, I'm sorry, the rest of the artiodactyls, the rest of the even-toed hoofed mammals, um, fairly early in their development, um, and then one group of this of these anchortheres evolved into hippopotamuses. Another group went into whales, and if we look at the primitive fossil whales, um, their limbs, the structure of their of their feet, is practically identical to these anchortheres and to um, primitive hippopotamuses. So it's pretty clear. Anyway, the point is that he's bringing this, in, that he's using this Mezzanica thing, which again, I'm going to say he's probably getting his information from Romer again. Um, and there's nothing wrong with Romer except for the fact that he's, well, 40 years out of date. And National Geographic told us that this is supposedly the ancestor of the whale. Ah, yes. National, Ge National Geographic article from 1976. Way to use current sources, Mr. Chair of the Paleontology Department. In fact, Stephen Jay Gould uh, mentioned uh, before his demise that Charles Darwin did state in one of his editions of Origin of the Species that he could readily imagine this creature, a mammal, uh, walking into uh, a miry area of a swamp that later was inundated by larger dimensions of water and, and in his lifetime developing the ability to adapt underwater. That is completely unscientific, unjustified, and absolutely ridiculous. And completely false and made up and pulled out of your ass, you senile old piece of shit. How dare you, fuckwad? All right? Yeah, that that's what Dar that's what Gould reported Darwin said. You're talking about he's talking about a a section in Origin where Darwin talked about um believing that a whale could have could possibly evolve from, you know, like a bear-like carnivore. Um this is again back before we had any genetic evidence before we had any good fossils to talk about it. And he, you know, it's been it's often that what Darwin said is truly mocked by creationists quite a bit, which I don't quite understand why, as it's, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's not correct, but it's not unscientific or anything like that. But Darwin never suggested, never said once, anywhere in any version of origin, that uh, within the lifetime of an animal, within the lifetime of a single organism, that it, you know, adapted to, you know, let it walked into a swamp and then decided to grow flippers. I mean, that's not, Darwin never said that. You, you're just, you're making it up. You're, again, it's this, that, you know, they, they don't have, these creatards have no actual evidence to support their theory. All they have is making the evolution position look bad by lying about what it actually says or proposes. That's all these, these, fucking asshats have and it really really makes me mad the the breathing apparatus would be so different it's just unbelievable not to mention the appendages the ligaments that are holding the blood vessels are going in different places in different directions before i go on here i do want to point out that his reconstruction of bacillosaurus he shows um they keep referring to bacillosaurus as as a whale as just a whale what the implication being that it really doesn't differ significantly from a modern whale it's just an extinct variety ignoring the fact that the uh well the teeth of bacillosaurus um retain the primitive mammal condition of being of of what's called a heterodonty meaning the teeth have different they have incisors and molars and things like that the teeth are crowned um not to the extent that we see, that you see in in most living mammals, um, but certainly far more than the teeth of living than than we see in whales today. Uh, also, let's see what other thing. Oh, they, he leaves out in that that reconstruction doesn't show the fact that they had back legs. 
Um, Basilosaurus had small, um, useless for walking, but back legs, uh, complete with, uh, you know, femur and all of the parts, uh, kneecap and little hooves on the tips of the claws. Uh, these are hoofed mammals, remember. Um, the, also, the blowhole of Basilosaurus was on the front of the nose, not between the eyes where it is in modern cetaceans. Um, it's looking at the, the structure of the spinal column and a number of other features from these reconstructed skeletons of, of Basilosaurus. Um, it's, it's believed with good evidence that they could, they were incapable of diving. They did not have the adaptations that modern cetaceans have uh, for being able to go very deep underwater at all. It's believed they were shallow coastal organisms. Um, anyway, so definitely not just a whale, no matter what they want you to believe here. But the point I want the audience to see, because to me it's obvious that the gaps are enormous. Notice that to go from here to here, there is no science involved, no real Ooh. science. It's strictly imagination. It's a stretch of the ludicrous. So keep that in mind, people. Uh, we have no fossils. We've got nothing that fills the gap between a terrestrial mammal and a whale. There's nothing in between all of our ideas about how that transition may have looked like or what it looked like, how it occurred, anything. It's all imagination, no fossils whatsoever, okay? Keep that in mind. Let's show them the next one. Pachycetus. Now, all we found originally were the bones in blue and the teeth, all right? Now, that's what they had. Now, the evolution involved in this, the actual evolution, I want the audience to see, is the dates. Wait, are you showing us a uh, one of those steps, one of those intermediates in between the land mammals and the whales? I thought those were all based on speculation. I thought they were out, you, you said, oh, just minutes ago that, uh, the entire span between a land mammal and a whale was based on imagination only, that there were no nothing to fill those gaps, and yet you're showing us one of the most important ones that we have. We're going to begin, and notice this is a major journal, Science, 1983. Yes. In 1983, when we had only the blue bones, he was called an alleged transition between land animals and whales. Alleged. Okay? But some evolution took place, Carl, from 1983 to 1994. Dr. Gendri Gingrich now tells us that Pachycetus is a perfect intermediate, a missing link between land mammals and whales. And he says this in a major work, Natural History. Yeah, that's right. In that 11-year period between the claim that Pachycetus was possibly a transition and the claim that it was an absolutely perfect transition, uh, no new information came in. We didn't discover any fossil anthrocytes that that connect Pachycetus to to stem artiodactyls. We didn't discover any fossil cetaceans that connect Pachycetus to modern whales. We didn't discover things like Ambulocetus and Rhodocetus and Indohyus. None of those things were, you know, no new discoveries came came forward in those eleven year in that eleven year period, right? This is again. You gotta keep current if you're going to make big sweeping claims about what we know about something. Uh, you you really should get your facts straight. That that's a simple bit of advice. However, more evolution took place, and we went from 1994 to 2001 in the British Journal, most prestigious uh, yes, we nature. have in Nature. Uh, <clears throat> the whale expert, Dr. Thewison unearthed more Pachycetus bones and it looked like this and then in 2004 the reconstruction was made and we can see how clearly this looks like this oh really so how dare those damn scientists alter their perceptions and reconstructions as new information comes in why they should they should pick a piece of dogma and just cling to it in the face of all other evidence against it that's what that's what science should do never change your mind or change your opinion or 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 accept new information well i am out of time i will go on to part 6